230. Number 10. Good evening. Glad you could be with us this evening. In the book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 5, we have recorded the Ten Commandments that, that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. Uh, in Matthew, chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, we have eight Beatitudes uh, that the Lord gave in that sermon. And in Deuteronomy, chapter 6, in verses 1 through 12, we find ten rules that were given to Israel so that their days may be prolonged. And uh, I want us to look at those tonight. And uh, these are called uh, Ten Rules of Success. And uh, we look at these, and if we apply these to our lives, we will be successful. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, let's read the first, let's read the verses, and uh, then we'll back up and talk about them. In verse 1, it says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the ordinances which Jehovah your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land, whether you go over to possess it, that thou mightest fear Jehovah thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, that thy days might be pro may be prolonged. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as Jehovah, the God of thy fathers, hath promised unto thee, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah, and thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be upon thy heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy, in thy house, and when thou walkest and by the way, and when thou liest down and when thou risest up, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gates. And it shall be when Jehovah thy God shall bring thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and cisterns hewn out which thou hewest not, 
vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, and thou shalt eat and be full. Then beware, lest thou forget Jehovah, who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Uh, we find ten rules of success here given to the children of Israel. Now, it's understood that we're no longer under the Old Testament. Uh, the old law was nailed to the cross when Christ was crucified. But Paul did say in, in uh, Romans chapter 15, says the things that were written aforetime were written for our learning. So we can look at what Moses has said here in this second giving of the law and learn some things about God and how we should live in a manner that's pleasing to him. So we'll start with verse 1. It says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the ordinances which Jehovah your God commanded to teach you, that you might do them in the land whither you go over to possess it. In this we find that we should respect the Lord's commandments. Uh, what does it mean, or how do we do this? How do we respect the Lord's commandments? Well, the best way to respect the Lord's commandments is to keep them or to do them. Uh, when God tells us to do something and we do it, that shows respect. In Psalms 119, in verse 6, it says, Then shall I not be put to shame when I have respect unto all thy commandments. In verse 15 it says, Psalmist says, I will meditate on thy precepts and have respect unto thy ways. So this is this is something that that we should do. We should respect the Lord's commandments. When we do what he says, we show respect. Um, because this is what he has commanded us to do. To go even further than that, we should have respect for the laws of the land. And, and, and in, the, in the process, we show respect to God when we obey the laws of the land. In Romans chapter 13, beginning at verse 1, Paul writes, Let every soul be in subjection to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God, and the powers that, are, that be are ordained of God. Therefore, he that resisteth the power withstandeth the ordinance of God, and they that withstand shall receive to themselves judgment. For rulers are not a terror to the good work, but to the evil. And wouldest thou have no fear of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise from the same. For he is a minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is a minister of God, an avenger for wrath to him that doeth evil. So why should we show respect not only to God's commandments, but for the laws and the commands of the land? Well, it says that, it says that these are from higher powers. There is no power but God, and these powers are to be ordained of God. Uh, God has instituted civil government uh, for our benefit. Uh, we're supposed to pray for peace uh, in our land. We're supposed to pray for our rulers so that we can have civil uh, a civil place to live so that his word can be spread. And, uh, and when we respect the laws of the land, uh, this, this does that. All right. Verse 2 it says that thou mightest fear Jehovah thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. We have a rule here that we should fear the Lord. And this is not a fear in a terror type of sense. This is a reverence uh, type of fear. Of the Lord, uh, Proverbs nine ten says, "Fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom." Uh, when we understand God's God's attributes, 
that, that he, is, he is just. He is perfectly just. He is perfectly righteous. Uh, and uh, we understand that God cannot, in that sense, cannot tolerate sin. Uh, so we should fear God uh, so that we are encouraged to obey his commandments. In Matthew chapter 10, in verse 28, It says, and be not afraid of them that kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Uh, like I said, this, this fear comes back to the fact that, that God is just. He is righteous. Sin cannot be in his presence. And, and for us to understand that means that there's not going to be any, uh, you know, well, you wasn't that bad, so you can come on into heaven. Uh, God, God has not worked that way. Uh, he, he is just. Man will be rewarded or punished for what he does. Uh, notice in Ecclesiastes what the preacher says in chapter 12, in verse 13. He says, this is the end of the matter. All hath been heard. He says, fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Uh, a fear of God is, is a healthy thing. It, it reminds us of where we need to be and what we need to be doing, how we need to behave. But notice in Hebrews chapter 13, beginning at verse 5, he says, Be ye free from the love of money, content with such things as ye have for himself. For God has said, I will in no wise fail thee, neither will I in any wise forsake thee. So that with good courage we say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What shall man do unto me? Uh, we're supposed to fear the Lord, but we shouldn't fear man. We shouldn't fear what man is going to do to us or what he can do to us because he can only do one thing, and that's, that's kill our body. And if we're right in the Lord, then there's, there's no problem. But notice what he says. He says, I will in no wise fail thee, neither will I in any wise forsake thee. As I said, God is, is just, he is, he is righteous, and he is faithful to keep his word. Uh, what God tells us, uh, and a lot of times we tend to concentrate on the bad, the wrong that we do, that God will punish us. And he's faithful in that, that respect, but he's also faithful in the fact that he will reward us if we're obedient, if we do what he says. And that is, it should be an encouragement to us that knowing that God will not fail us and he will not forsake us. So fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. In verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 6, it says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as Jehovah, the God of thy fathers, has promised unto thee, in a land flowing with milk and honey. Not only are we to respect the Lord's commandments and fear the Lord, show reverence to him, but we're to hear. He says, Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it. Uh, you, you've heard people say, Did you, did you hear me? And they say, I was listening. You'll say, Yes, I heard you. But they say, Where were you listening? There, there's a difference. Uh, and this is what uh, Moses is saying here. You know, we need to listen. We need to hear what God says and understand it. God is to be heard. His commandments are to be understood and to be observed and to be performed so that God may be glorified. Uh, and we have examples of people that claimed they heard God, but they didn't. In 1 Samuel... Uh, Chapter 15, we're all familiar with this account of Saul. Notice in verse 1, it says, And Samuel said unto Saul, Jehovah sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of Jehovah. Thus saith Jehovah of hosts, I have marked that which, which 
Amalek did to Israel, how he set himself against him in the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now notice what the Lord says. He says, Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, and camel and ass. Uh, now notice verse 13. It says, When Samuel came to Saul, Verse 13 says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, He said, Blessed be thou of Jehovah, I have performed the commandment of Jehovah. Now, Samuel spoke for God, told Saul what he was supposed to do, what was required of him. Uh, and here, what did Saul say in verse 13? He says, I have performed the commandments of Jehovah. Well, he's saying that he heard what God said, but he didn't listen. Uh, he did not do what God told him. Um, notice in verse 21, it says, But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the devoted things, to sacrifice unto Jehovah thy God in Gilgal. And, that, and notice what Samuel said. He says, Hath Jehovah great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of Jehovah? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. Now notice verse 23 says, For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry and terrapin. Because thou hast rejected the word of Jehovah, he hath also rejected thee from being king. When we hear what God says, but we do not observe to do it, there will be, there will be consequences. As we've seen here with Saul. And we know from Saul's history that everything seems to go downhill from here uh, for Saul. So when we hear God's commandments, we need to observe them and do them. Um, in chapter 4, or verse 4 of chapter 6, it says, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God is one Jehovah. King James says the Lord our God is one Lord. And we can learn from this verse that we are to exalt the Lord. It says the Lord our God is one Lord. What does, what does it mean to exalt the Lord? Well, exalt means to raise high. Uh, we are to live in such a way and praise God in such a way that he's raised up to a place that he deserves. He is the creator. It was by his grace that his son came and died on the cross that we could have forgiveness of our sins. And God deserves a, to be exalted. He is one Lord. He is our Lord and the one Lord. Notice in Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah 44. Verse 6. It says, Thus saith Jehovah, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, Jehovah of hosts. The Lord said, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. God is the only God. He is the only supreme being. He said himself that he's first and last, and besides him, there is nothing else. And that's why the Lord should be exalted, uh, because he is the one God. Now, notice in the New Testament, a comment on this in the book of James, in James chapter 2. Verse 9. It says, Thou believest that God is one, thou doest well, but the demons also believe and shudder. So we are to exalt God because he is one Lord. He is the one and only God, but just believing that he is God is not enough. Um, the demons even believe in God, uh, but, they will, but they will suffer. So just saying that someone believes in God and he'll take care of the rest is, is not good enough. We have to 
as we said, started out, respect the Lord's commandments. We have to fear him. We have to hear what he says and do what he says. Uh, and that in, exalts the Lord also. Uh, there's one God, not many. In verse 5, it says, Thou shalt love Jehovah thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is, this is the first and greatest command. It says, love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind. This consumes our entire being uh, that, that we should love the Lord with. Uh, notice, notice what Christ says in John chapter 14, verse 15. He says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If we love the Lord, it's not enough to just mechanically do what God says. It has to be done with love. Uh, everything we do should be love. Uh, notice in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, verse 36 beginning it says the Pharisees asked Christ as teacher which is the great commandment in the law and he said unto them thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy mind this is the great and first commandment and a second like unto it is this thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself now notice what he says he says on, on these two commandments the whole law hangeth and the prophets this is what everything is built on. If we do not love God and do not love our fellow man, uh, what, what we're doing is, is useless. It has to be done in love. Love for God and love for our fellow man. Um, in 1 Timothy, First Timothy chapter 2, Verse 5 says, For there is one God, one mediator also. No, chapter 1, verse 5, I'm sorry. It says, But the end of the charge, or end of the command, is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience and faith unfeigned. Love is, is necessary. Uh, as I said, if you know, we do things without love in our heart, it, it doesn't mean anything. To God, so we should love the Lord with all our heart, our soul, and our mind, and we should because He is the one Lord. Because of what He has done for us, um, He saved the children of Israel. Uh, by and Moses reminds them of this in this in this uh, in this chapter. Uh, he took them out of hand out of Egypt, took them out of bondage, uh, but He's done so much more for us. That, that that love ought to be automatic. In verse 6, it says, And these words which I command thee this day shall be upon thy heart. So we should let God's word dwell in our hearts. Uh, what did Paul say in 2 Timothy? He said, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. When we study, Enough to show ourselves a workman that is approved unto God. We're letting God's word dwell in our heart. And uh, this, this, is, this is how we make it. This is how we fight the good fight. This is how we are faithful unto death, as it says in Revelation, uh, by letting God's word dwell in our heart, by letting it guide us uh, in our everyday actions. In Hebrews chapter 8, we see reference to the word dwelling in our hearts. Beginning at verse 10 in Hebrews chapter 8, he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind, and on their heart also will I write them. And I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people, and they shall not teach every man his fellow citizen, and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities, and their sins will I remember no more. Uh, this is a quote from Jeremiah 31, 31. 
Um, and what it's talking about is the church. No more will man be a child of God just because of who his parents are, because of his, his earthly lineage. Um, and then have to teach him about God. For us to be a child of God, at, uh, he says he will make the house of Israel, this is the church. Um, he says, I will put my laws in their mind and on their heart. Will I write them? Man has to be taught. Uh, he has to be taught to become a Christian. And uh, as Christians, we should let God's word dwell in our hearts. Um, notice in Colossians chapter 3. Beginning at verse 16. It says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts unto God. We are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly. Uh, and when we do that, in all wisdom, we teach and admonish one another uh, as we've done tonight by singing psalms and hymns. Uh, that's why we're commanded to sing and nothing else. Uh, we're not commanded to play instruments or, or listen to other people sing, but we're to admonish or teach and admonish one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and sing with grace in our hearts unto God. Um, when we do that, the word of Christ is dwelling in us, and we're sharing it and teaching each other. Uh, by playing instruments, you cannot learn. You cannot be taught or admonished uh, by someone playing an instrument. And uh, that's why we are commanded to sing. So, <clears throat> but for God's word to dwell in our hearts, like Paul said in 2 Timothy, we have to spend time in the word. We have to read. Uh, we have to study. Uh, that's why the elders have two, two lessons on Sunday and a Bible class, and they have Bible classes on Wednesday night, is, is to help us learn, is to provide uh, an organized opportunity to sit and be taught the Bible. And, uh, and that's, that, but that's not enough. We should be doing it ourselves. We should uh, study every day and learn every day. In verse 7, of Deuteronomy chapter 6, Moses continues and says, Thou shalt teach them diligently the commands that, he, that God has given. He says, Teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Uh, it doesn't seem like he leaves any time for anything else. But the point here is to teach your children, is to teach them diligently. And diligently means steady. Do something steady. Do it in earnest and in an energetic application and effort. It means to be steadfast. Uh, don't just do it every couple of weeks. Don't do it once a month. But to be diligent about it. Uh, be steadfast in teaching our children. Um, and this is so important. And it doesn't mean that we have to do it all day, every day, as, as, as the text seems to hint at, but what he's getting at is be consistent with it. Take every opportunity to teach a lesson about God and his word uh, to the children. And that's, that's what should be done. They should, uh, you know, when we do that, they grow and they learn as they grow up. But what happens if we fail to do this, if, if the children are not taught diligently if, if, and bring them to church twice, three times a week is not enough. Uh, that's why Moses said, you know, every day, be diligent in this process. But what happens uh, when the parents fail to do this? Notice in the, the book of Judges, in Judges chapter 2, beginning at verse 10, it says, And also that generation were gathered unto their fathers that had passed away. And there arose another generation after them that knew not Jehovah, 
nor yet the work which he had wrought for Israel. Now notice verse 11. And the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah and served the Balaam. Uh, so when children don't know God, when they're not taught God, when they're not taught diligently, uh, this is what can happen. Uh, it says they did that which was evil in the sight of Jehovah and they served the Balaam. And so this is why this is so important to teach to teach the children uh, because it will affect the church. Uh, and, and today, if the children are not taught, the church will dwindle as the years come along. And uh, when, when the church dwindles, there's not enough people that's still teaching and preaching the word. Uh, and that's what God expects us to do as Christians. And so... This is definitely a rule of success, uh, teaching the children diligently. Uh, you have to have house rules that rule the house. In verse 8, it says, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. Uh, so we learn from this that we should, we should adorn our life with God's commandments, with his teachings. We should wear them in our in our life, uh, the Hill and David's commentary says this is a figurative, and said it denotes uh, these commands are figurative and denotes an undeviating observance of the divine commands, and that's what uh, is 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 meant here. Uh, is that they should be carried with us? Uh, our lives should be adorned with them. And that's why I wrote down what they said because they said it so much better than I could. It's an undeviating observance of the divine command. And, uh, and, and that's the way we should be. We should not deviate in the least in observing God's commands. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9, Notice what it says here. It says, In like manner that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefastness and sobriety, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly raiment, but which becometh women professing godliness through good works. We can apply this to men as well in the sense that, that we should adorn ourselves Professing godliness through our good works. That's that's what it means to adorn our life uh, with the commandments of God. That that we live in such a way that people see in us Christ every day. Um, now notice Matthew chapter twenty three. In verse five. But we can't go too far with this, as Matthew notes here. It says, but all their works they do to be seen of men, for they make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. So we have to be careful. We have to live in such a way that people see Christ in us, that they know we're followers of God and followers of Christ, that we're Christians. But we're not to do it in such a way that, that, that we appear to be pious, in a sense, uh, as as these Pharisees were doing, it says they were doing them to be seen of men. They should be seen of men, but if they're done the right way, uh, it will be pleasing to God. If that's the only reason we do it, if we go out of our way to be seen of men, then this is wrong. Uh, and this is what uh, Moses is talking about here. In verse 8, it says, Bind them for a sign upon thy hand, and they shall be for frontlets between thine eyes. These frontlets, uh, this is what the Pharisees were doing. These phylacteries, as they call them, were small leather boxes or a cover that uh, contained strips of parchment with quotations from the books of Moses. Uh, and these were worn by every male Israelite above 13 years of age during morning prayer except on the Sabbath and the holy days. 
uh, from what I've read, it didn't come into practice until the children of Israel came back from uh, Babylon. But the point that Moses was making, though, is to keep them, keep them forefront in your lives. Always do the commands of God um, and not do them in such a way uh, to be seen as men to make oneself look, look better. In verse 9 it says, And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thy house and upon thy gates. So we should decorate our homes with the commands of God. Um, we should let them be the identifier of the home. It's the same principle as in letting them adorn our life. When people come into our home, it shouldn't take them very long to figure out whether it's a Christian home or not. Uh, that they should be able to see that. And again, not in a overt look at me type of way, as, as a lot of people seem to do, uh, to try to draw their attention to themselves. Uh, people should see it in how we live our everyday lives. And we can see an example of this in Isaiah chapter 39. In Isaiah chapter 39, verse 4. Merodach, Baladan, the son of Baladan, the king of Babylon, had come to Hezekiah, the king, and uh, Hezekiah had shown him around his house. And Isaiah asked him in verse 4, he says, What have they seen in thy house? And Hezekiah answered, All that is in my house have they seen. There is nothing among my treasures that I have not showed them. But what is the one thing that Hezekiah did not show the Babylonians? He didn't show them God. Uh, he showed them gold, precious things, and armor, but he did not show God. So we should decorate our homes uh, with the commands of God. The last two verses, verse, or three verses, verse 10 through 12, says, And it shall be when Jehovah thy God shall bring thee into the land which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of good things which thou fillest not, and cisterns hewn out which thou hewest not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not, and thou shalt eat and be full. Notice what he says. Then beware, lest thou forget Jehovah, who brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Uh, God is a giver. God was supplying these great blessings uh, to the children of Israel. Uh, he was providing everything they needed. Uh, they didn't have to wait for these vineyards and plantations to grow to harvest the food off of them. Uh, they didn't have to wait till wells or cisterns were dug. They didn't have to wait till their houses were built. All, everything was in place. Even the, the, the goods, the things inside the house were supplied by God um, in this land of milk and honey but notice what Moses said he says beware lest thou forget Jehovah who brought thee forth out of the land we have to remember as our last rule remember that God is the giver we are the receiver uh, we have to be careful not to let the blessings of our prosperity cause us to forget to forget God and uh, that is an easy thing to do Seems the more prosperous a man becomes, the most more likely he is to forget God. And uh, there's nothing wrong with being prosperous. God can bless us in that way. But as, as long as we do not let it be first in our life. We've gone over these ten rules of success from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Respect the Lord's commandments with fear of the Lord. Hear the Lord. We should exalt the Lord. Love the Lord. Let the word, God's word, dwell in our hearts. Teach God's word diligently to the children. Adorn our life with God's words. Decorate our homes with God's word. And remember that God is the giver, that he is the one that provides our blessings. So I believe if we, if we remember these rules of success, if we follow them, put them in our lives, uh, that, that we will be successful. Not necessarily physically, worldly successful, but we will be spiritually successful. But to be spiritually successful, you have to be 
a member of the body of Christ. Uh, and the New Testament teaches us that we're supposed to hear the word, uh, believe what it says, repent of our sins, confess Christ as the Son of God, and be baptized for the remission of sins. Uh, if you have not done that, now is the time to do it. Uh, if you are a Christian, and maybe you haven't been following these rules of success, uh, maybe you haven't been doing as you should, uh, that can be remedied too also in prayer to God. He is faithful. He will not forsake us even when we sin. He will forgive us our sins if we ask for it. Thank you. Thank you.